Um, yeah, I've got I've got slides. So should I screen share? So hang on, how do I do that? Uh, I mean, the green one. The green one. All right. Okay. Screen. Got it. Yep. All good. Gotcha. Radio. Let's get started. Um, so the uh, my my camera's on a slight angle from my screen. So if I keep looking to the side, don't be surprised. Um, so yeah, I guess the current world revolves around social platforms that are based on surveillance capitalism. And this isn't a, just a problem for individuals. This is a problem for democracy itself. Uh, and this is this is our core motivation uh, for building PeerGoss, um, which I'm going to tell you a bit, bit more about and some of the cool things in IPFS that we use. Uh, there we go. Yep. So let's, let's start off with uh, the overall architecture. So essentially you have a, a, a PeerGoss instance is paired with an IPFS instance. And that's it. Due to the beauty of IPFS, that's as complicated as our architecture gets. So you can have many, many instances of, of, of PeerGoss with IPFS, and that could be on a phone, that could be on a server somewhere, it doesn't really matter. And with the, again, the power of IPFS, you can log in through any server, you can modify stuff th through any instance, and it just works. Um, it's trustless, so we've designed it so you don't have to trust the, the, the particular instance you're using at all. Uh, it's independent of DNS. Most of the heavy lifting there is done by IPFS. Uh, and also, yeah, independent of the, the TLS certificate authorities. And so the question is, what happens when, when you're logged in through, uh, sorry, there's one more assumption, which is you, you need at least one uh, PeerGoss instance to store your data. That's just for availability, uh, mainly for availability. And so then the question is, what, what, what happens if you're logging in through another one and you modify something? Where does that end up? Uh, so one of, the, one of the core things we use from IPFS are peer-to-peer -peer streams. And this is, this is the crux of how we get around relying or not relying on, on DNS at all. And at the lowest level, a peer-to-peer -peer stream is, is just a, basically a socket between end-to-end -end authenticated encrypted socket between two IPFS instances. Uh, and last, last December, uh, we implemented a thing on top of that, which is uh, in, the, in the gateway, a HTTP proxy over peer-to-peer -peer streams. And it allows you to make a, a normal HTTP request to any, any IPFS instance, essentially. And so we use that uh, in, in, this, in this case. So let's say Alice has, has her, her server, which is storing her data somewhere, and she's logged in through some other instance, which could be on her phone or someone else's, doesn't really matter. And she wants to modify a file. What happens is she can, through her, her local PeerGoss instance, that then makes a request to IPFS, a HTTP request, which gets tunneled over this peer-to-peer -peer stream magically <clears throat> uh, and ends up on her target server. And so the data ends up being stored there, and that's also a, a form of consensus uh, for her data alone. <clears throat> so it's super cool, and this this is a it's a very general mechanism. So at the moment, it's an, an experimental feature; you need to enable it. Um, but once you've done that, it's super easy, and you can the target node obviously has to you have to tell it to listen and where to forward the request to as a proxy. Um, but using this kind of peer-to-peer -peer proxy, you can do a kind of gradual transition for any application to IPFS. Um, so it doesn't matter if it has you know, traditional databases or whatever it is, you can host them behind essentially an IPFS instance and have the whole thing operate independent of DNS, which, which, which is super cool. Um, and you know, it also solves all the, all the usual IPFS problems like the, the firewall, you could host it at home, for example. So it, it's a very powerful technique. And because it's transparently proxying HTTP request, the clients or whatever, whatever interface you're using, if it's HTTP, a web, website, doesn't, doesn't need any changing. So yeah, like more, more people should, should do something with this. Um, but back to PeerGoss for now. 
uh, semantically, you end up with a, a global file system. Uh, you're, you get a directory, which is your username. And within that directory, you can put your stuff and do whatever you like. Uh, so that's the only point of, of consensus globally is when you sign up, guaranteeing unique usernames. Um, and within, within your file system, you can, uh, you've got fine-grained access control. You can uh, share individual files or entire directories. Uh, the encryption we do is we're careful to be uh, quantum resistant. It's not 100% post-quantum yet, shall we say, but the aim is to, to migrate to that. <clears throat> uh, in terms of access control, let me tell you a little bit about that. So this is uh, it's called a, a structure called CryptTree. Um, Basically, every file or directory ends up with two symmetric keys, and so in this in this uh, in this diagram, every blue bo uh, green box is a is a is a key, a symmetric key, and if you have a key, you can follow the arrows from that key to to, to decrypt the subsequent keys, and so if you have the base key for a directory, you can derive the base key for all the children in that directory. Uh, and this way, this gives you recursive access control, which scales very nicely. Um, the only slight complication is you want to have a well-defined path. If I grant you access only to a file, you want to be able to, that, to have a path, but without getting access to the parent directory or indeed to the siblings in the, in the same directory. Uh, and that has these, these, these backlinks from the, the file's parent key to the parent directories, parent keys. And that all that does is give you access to the encrypted metadata of the parent directory, which is the, which is the name. So that's the path. Um, and yeah, so to grant someone read access, you basically tell them the location of, a, of something and, and one of these base keys. So it's, yeah, it's capability based. In terms of read, uh, sorry, write access, uh, it's actually a lot simpler. Um, Rights, uh, rights are all signed, um, and a directory or a file can uh, have a different signing authorizing key from its parent. Um, and so the idea is you, you have a, a single key for every, every file or directory, and whoever has that, that symmetric base key uh, can then derive the signing key pair used to authorize rights to that thing, whatever it is. Uh, and that's essentially an IPNS key. It's not literally an IPNS key, but yeah. <clears throat> uh, how does it work? Um, procedurally, what happens? So if you upload a file, it gets split into five megabyte chunks. That's important. We'll get to that later. Uh, each of those is independently encrypted and then split into 128K fragments. There's various padding and things that we do as well to try and hide the actual uh, even modulo five meg file size. Uh, and you actually, you can't even tell the difference between a directory and a, and a small file from a, from a network point of view. Uh, and these are all uploaded into IPFS along with the, the, the encrypted uh, metadata, which is that cryptry thing that we just saw uh, with Merkle links to the fragments. So this is all IPLD. <clears throat> One of the benefits of chunking files like that is you get fantastic support for large files. So even just uploading a file, if you're encrypting the whole file at once, that basically means you need to, to fit that whole file and, into memory if you're not chunking it. So with this, we get a, is, chunking gives you a streaming approach so you can efficiently upload files. You can, you can download files in a streaming manner. So you could be playing a large movie and rather than waiting to download the whole movie, you can start playing as soon as you've got the first five meg, uh, which takes a second, <clears throat> a second or so. And one super cool thing, which uh, I know at least one, one person, are they still here? Oh, they were earlier, I can't see the full, anyway. Someone in the audience is aware of, is um, zero IO seeking. So what does that mean? So if you're on a normal operating system and you're, you've got some file open and you want to seek way, way, way down the file, gigabytes, I don't know, maybe in terabytes, then, I mean, it depends on what the file system is, how, how that works, but there'll be some kind of a lookup in a table somewhere, maybe chasing some pointers. Um, 
but one of our key things is we, we don't want to expose the size of files to the network. So the, the, the fact the different chunks of a file can't be linked externally. So there's no, there's no visible linkage between them. Uh, and originally we did that was with basically an encrypted link from one chunk to the next. Uh, and that works, it's, it's, it, but it means that seeking is, is quite slow because you need to traverse this linked list of encrypted pointers which means downloading just the metadata, but still for each five megabyte section and, and traversing through. But there's a super cool new technique, which, uh, which we came up with at IPFS camp actually, um, which is zero IO. So once you've got the first chunk, you can then deduce with just hashing zero IO, the location of any, any later chunk in that file. Uh, in such a way that we still don't expose the connection between chunks to the network. And so, yeah, if you're seeking in a movie, you just get the first chunk, do a bunch of hashing, and then you get the target chunk you actually want to see, and then download it. Uh, there's nothing, you don't, you don't need to download anything in the middle. Uh, so it's super efficient and yeah, very cool. And we'll show you a demo of that in a second. Uh, so what the, the crypt tree nodes that the metadata, uh, we put in this data structure called a champ, uh, which is a compressed hash array mapped try. Uh, it's a Merkle champ. Uh, the same structure is used in Filecoin. Uh, it has a bunch of nice properties. Um, mostly it's, it's insertion order independent. Uh, so for a given, so it, functionally it's, it's a map, it's a key value mapping. So for the same, functional map, you would always end up with the same root, no matter what order you, you insert stuff in, uh, which means it plays very well with things like CRDTs, which we also care about. Uh, how, how do we do login in a decentralized setting? There's no, there's no server that's authorizing you. Um, we basically take your password, uh, we salt it with your username and, and another salt, higher entropy salt, and put that through script which is a memory hard hashing function. And the output is a, a root key, a symmetric root key, which is your root directory. And two key pairs, one is a signing key pair, which is your identity. And another is a boxing key pair, which is used for social things. So sending follower requests uh, and sharing files and so forth. Um, these, these are never, only ever stored in RAM. It's never written to disk or transmitted. And we tune it to take about a second, but we still claim that it's, it's impossible to, to, to practically brute force, uh, even, if, even if you're the NSA. Another cool thing is you can share files outside of Pyrgos, uh, and I'll demonstrate this as well. Um, given that it's a capability-based system, all we need is a way to put the capability into, the, into a URL. And this is a standard technique. People put the capability after the, the hash, the fragment in the URL which means it's not actually sent to the server. So secret links still aren't even exposed to the server itself. And that all, all that's in the URL is basically the location, which in our case is the, the public signing key, the label in the champ and the symmetric decryption key. How about some uses, some practical stuff? What, what can we do? So we're pretty ambitious with Pigos. It's not just file storage and sharing. As I mentioned at the beginning, we're aiming to be a, a kind of a social protocol. And one of those things is, is an application platform. So we have the ability to run apps in a sandbox. Uh, this is in the browser. And we have to be super careful because when you're logged in, your keys are in, in the browser, right, in memory. And with all the kind of Spectre and Meltdown attacks, you don't want things to be even in the same process, let alone have access. So we're super, super paranoid about that. But essentially an app is in Pyrgos is just an HTML5 thing. Um, the only extra thing is, is a, a basically a JSON document saying what permissions you want. And then it's up to the individual uh, whether or not they want to grant uh, these kinds of permissions to, to a particular app. And so, you know, updating an app or deploying an app is just uploading the files to Pyrgos. And you can keep it secret, you can, you can make it public or share it, whatever. So it's, it's very powerful. Um, 
And so now I'm going to I'm going to show you some examples of some of these applications and a few other things we've we've done. Uh, so I'm going to switch to Chrome, and I think I won't even need to do that after the 10th of January. Basically, the the way we do streaming of, of large files uh, with the thing called writable stream in JavaScript, Firefox have, haven't implemented it, or rather they have, but it's not been released yet. So, but it will in January. So anyway, let's, uh, let's see. So if we go and find a video and try and view that. So this is uh, it's 120 meg. So there's whatever, do the math, 24 five meg chunks in that. Uh, it's the sound getting through. Well, you can you can hopefully see that. <clears throat> and yeah, so this is downloading five megabytes at a time, decrypting it, piping it to a video element on the fly. And you can, if you see there, you can see it's only downloaded the first section of it. Um, so we haven't downloaded the whole file at once. Um, so you can stream arbitrarily large videos. It could be gigabytes, it doesn't matter. And if I go and seek ahead and click somewhere down there, then all this, this is doing that, that uh, IOLUS seeking thing. Um, almost all of this time is getting the chunk at the end. The hashing itself is, is under a second. And, and there we go. So. Seeking, cool, that's video. Um, we don't actually need the application framework for that because browsers already have a built-in video thing. But if we had, for example, a custom video player, like maybe VLC or something, then yes, we would sandbox that. Uh, we can play audio as well, uh, uh, do things like images. We've got a basic gallery here. Uh, the thumbnails, uh, they're also encrypted. They're part of the metadata of the file. And yeah, so super simple uh, image gallery. Not sure. Oh. Oh, there we go. OK, right. I think my machine's under a bit of load at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, images, uh, what else? So if we go back, well, no, I'm going to do it here. Um, we have a, a PDF viewer. So this is the talk here. So this is just pdf.js. So that's Mozilla's JavaScript PDF viewer. But this is sandboxed and reading data from, you know, directly from Pegos. Uh, so and that, that's actually what I'm using to give the talk from in the other in the other browser window. So so that's fun. Uh, what else? Um, oh, we have a now we have a basic text editor. So uh, here's a here's a recipe. Um, it has syntax highlighting, so it, it thinks this is Markdown. So these numbers are a different color. Um, you can edit that and, and save it. Um, in, in the normal way. Uh, it also understands code. So if we open this core.go, what's that? That's some IPFS source code itself. Uh, and so on. So yeah, we, we handle most, most common languages and, and just raw text as well. Uh, yeah, so let's go back to the presentation. All right, yeah, so we've had the demo. Uh, yeah, so we have a, a, an alpha, a free alpha that's live at the moment, alpha.peergos.net. Uh, if you want more technical detail, there's a book, book.peergos.org, and everything's on GitHub. Uh, and yeah, there's, there's five of us at the moment. So yeah, go, go try it out. Tell us what you think. Give us feedback. Any awesome. questions? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Ian. Uh, awesome stuff. Um, question for you. The um, uh, thing that you call uh, uh, zero, uh, zero IO hashing, uh, seeking, sorry. Um, is there a, a specification write-up or anything like this that you have written somewhere or it's only in your uh, Java implementation right now? Uh, 
Uh, I can tell you now, it's very simple. So the, the idea is we have the, the very beginning of a file uh, in the encrypted metadata, there's a secret, which is just 32 random bytes. And to get the subsequent chunk of a chunk in a file, all we do is we hash, I believe it's SHA-256, we hash the current label plus that secret. And it's just the same secret throughout the entire file. I see. So, so essentially, you have all your links in in the first, in the in the root chunk, so to speak. Uh, you uh, cannot you cannot seek from the from the middle towards the end kind of thing, right? You need to have the head. Uh, you you need to have the information that's in the head. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And for those for those who don't know, it was was talking to Peter that we came up with this at IPFS camp. So yeah, thank you. Any other question? I have a question about the uh, authentication. Um, so I guess uh, there's no like revocable, uh, like if I forget my password, that's that's it, right? At the moment, yes. If you forget your password, it's game over. Uh, Longer term, we want to basically have a social recovery mechanism. So you could nominate M friends, any N of whom can recover your password. Uh, that would just be Shami a secret sharing, uh, but we haven't implemented that yet. Would you consider using a um, kind of like a phone book, like uh, people are identified by their phone number, but you can give them whatever name you want to? Uh, we, we probably will when we have a, a, a sort of an address book allow you to have phone numbers in there, but we we don't we try to avoid taking any like we don't even need an email address to sign up. Um, so we're trying to avoid taking any any information. Uh, what I meant was um, like I'm just using the phone number as an analogy. So All right. like I have a unique phone number, but you know my mom called me one thing and my friends call me something else. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so you, you mean like a, a label for your friends that's a different different from their name? Right, rather than requiring everyone to have a unique username, uh, they have a unique ID, and then you can just call them whatever you like. Well, it's effectively the same thing. So the ID still needs consensus to, to guarantee uniqueness. Right, um, unless you use and like a random, random number, like, uh, like a randomly generated crypto key or whatever. I mean, even, even random numbers to, to be 100% sure, yes. Um, but one of our things is we want to have uh, human readable paths, and so you can you can you can uh, basically give you can publish a capability. This is not the secret link. This is something else. You can publish a capability to to something a file, and then you can go to any PeerGos server and browse to slash peergos, uh, sorry slash public, and then the path, which is your use the the target's username and, and the path to the file, and that will just work. And that's so that's 100 human readable and makes sense. Yeah, and safe. And this is really cool, by the way. Thanks for presenting today. No worries. Question, Ian. Um, are you familiar with something called Off System? Off System. Right. It's it's sort of like a. Uh, it's very obscure, but and I don't know that much about it, but it's somewhat akin to this where you're taking data and you're creating these like Lego blocks that you can send out and then reassemble. Um, and I just thought maybe this uh, Pure Goss was inspired by Off System, if you'd heard of it. it was I haven't heard of it. Uh, our direct inspiration is a, a thing called Voila, which was a peer-to-peer -peer storage thing over a decade ago now, they got bought and shut down eventually, as usually happens, because they weren't open source. But um, they, they're the ones who actually invented Cryptree, the, the structure. We've, we've tweaked it and modified it a bit for, our, for the IPFS setting, but they, they invented the, the idea. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, and with that, we are about out of time. Thanks so much for sharing this. Uh, we'll keep our eye on it, man. Um, please keep us posted on you know, new releases and whatnot.
I shared a link to the alpha in the in the chat there for folks to to mess around with it themselves. And uh, I, I will, it, you can uh, stop sharing if you like, and we'll get great big faces to say goodbye. Uh, thanks again for, for coming out, everybody, and Ian for presenting. And we'll see you in three weeks. Good one. Thank you.